it's my pleasure to, to introduce our speaker for tonight is going to talk on the topic of modern slavery, combating trafficking in persons. And so um, Mark has been an expert on international trafficking in persons for at least the last 22 years. Uh, and I, I worked in that field uh, at the US Embassy in Jakarta before in Indonesia. And I say that, that Mark, Mark was the most dedicated and most dedicated and conscientious and talented person working in this field that 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 I ever that I ever worked with. Um, he started off working on, on trafficking in persons by starting the first U.S. anti-trafficking persons project in South Asia. Um, he later did similar work in in Nigeria, um, and from there, when when I I knew him around around 2000. Around 2007 to, to 2010, he led the uh, reporting and political affairs section of the State Department's Trafficking in Persons Office, where he produced a large volume of very comprehensive reports on trafficking. But beyond that, he traveled. He traveled around. He traveled around to all the posts that all of the places that were under his purview, and um, and I know that, that that he and I, when we worked together on trafficking in persons in Indonesia, that that we uh, together witnessed some of the most horrible, horrible cases of uh, persons that were sold into human slavery. Um, we, we dealt with the families whose, whose young sons and daughters were, were murdered um, and also with, with, young, with young women, young boys as well uh, that were totally traumatized by, by trafficking, uh, were actually destroyed for life. Uh, so then, in 2013, he moved to Thailand, where he became the uh, be became the team leader of a 50 million dollar Australian government funded program to fight to fight trafficking, and most recently, uh, he served as senior technical advisor to the Global Fund to End Slavery, um, assisting this new this new fund with projects in the Philippines, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and India. Uh, Mark lives in, in 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 Chiang Mai as an independent consultant now. So, uh, so Mark, thank you so much for joining us early in the morning in Thailand. It's great to see you again. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you now. Great. Well, thank you, Stan, and thank you, Joe, for this this opportunity to to talk about uh, the serious issue of trafficking in persons. Um, and uh, I'd like to start off by just uh, framing the issue a little bit. Some of you may have heard of this issue. Um, maybe if you've been watching CNN in the last few days, you've seen some advertisements for what CNN calls my Freedom Day coming up on March 16th, uh, which is a public campaign to raise awareness about, uh, about human trafficking. Um, first, it's a term that's quite expansive and it also has many different labels. Formally, it's called trafficking in persons. Uh, that's a, a legal term that's recognized internationally and in the United States. Uh, we also call it just in sh for shorthand, human trafficking. Modern day slavery is a, uh, a label that's been used more often uh, in the last few years. Um, all of these terms apply to the same thing. Now, if you, if you look at this uh, chart that I've put up, uh, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, which has been in existence for over 100 years, uh, has the best uh, framework for estimating this, this, this problem. Uh, and as you can see here, we start with modern slavery, and that splits into two main categories, forced labor and forced marriage. And for the purpose of our discussion today, I'm going to exclude forced marriage, and if you'd like to know more about that, we can we can uh, talk about that in the in the discussion. But I'm going to focus on forced labor and the three bottom uh, uh, boxes because this is what we're really uh, challenged with worldwide in the United States. First is state-imposed forced labor. Actually, that's not in the United States, but this is something that that uh, exists in some parts of the world. Uh, you might have seen recently news about the Uyghurs uh, forced into cotton production in China, and that's even led to some legislation that's being um, 
debated in Congress. Uh, North Korea uh, forces some of its citizens into uh, labor for its own um, commercial benefit. So that's, that's that state for imposed forced labor. Then there's the largest category, just forced labor in general, or here it's the, the word exploitation is added, but that's, that's really a, an extra. And this is the private sector. This is everything from formal factories, formal um, supply chains to informal uh, work that might be in agriculture on the streets, uh, anything for compensation. And then the third category is forced sexual exploitation of adults and commercial sexual exploitation of children. And that, that's a mouthful. It's, uh, but, but basically this is what we call sex trafficking. It's the forced prostitution of adults or children. And I'll get into why that division is made there between adults and children in, in just, a, just a little bit. So the ILO in, in creating an estimate on this entire problem, and it does this about every three or four years, the last time was in 2017, uh, it came up with an estimate of almost 25 million victims worldwide. And this you can see is the, the breakdown where you have almost 5,000 uh, victims of, of trafficking in sexual exploitation, about, sorry, 5 million, uh, 4 million in state imposed forced labor, and then that largest group, 64% of the victims in the private sector. Also, just a, a quick look at the, the, the sex uh, ratio of victims to point out that most victims of human trafficking are are female, they're women and, and girls, uh, most pronounced in sexual exploitation or forced prostitution, where it's almost 100%, um, but still the majority even in private sector labor exploitation, forced labor, you can see 57.6 um, and, uh, and in state imposed forced labor. To, to try to, uh, there, there, there's some, some rather long legal definitions of human trafficking. But to try to, to break this down easily uh, is this, is this three, uh, three pillars or elements of trafficking. Basically, it's any action that one person uh, takes against another uh, for the purpose of exploitation. And that's any labor or service um, that can be exploited for commercial gain. So commercial sex uh, or forced prostitution is one outcome of that. Labor trafficking or forced labor is the other. Uh, and then I skipped over the middle. That's those actions accomplished through a means of force, fraud, or coercion. So this is these, the, 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 as we'll see, as I go along that the examples of what human trafficking looks like around the world vary very, uh, super widely, these three elements will always be there. And just looking briefly at the actions, those can be very active, like transporting somebody, uh, recruiting somebody, or they can be very passive, like harboring, just having somebody in your, um, in your home, in your business, obtaining somebody, uh, receiving somebody. Uh, and on the means, I want to just highlight that we, we tend to focus first and foremost on force because force is, is, uh, can be very visible. It can be very, it can be physical abuse. It can be sexual abuse, uh, restraints, uh, efforts to confine somebody, but it can also be very passive or very hidden, uh, like debt like uh, threats of violence, threats of um, harm, such as uh, having somebody uh, deported from the country or arrested for having committed a crime. Also, I wanna, wanna note that you see the footnote at the bottom that for children, there's a provision in both US and international law and accepted definition 
of trafficking among, among most practitioners that children who are uh, exploited in commercial sex are um, automatically victims of trafficking, that the element of force or fraud does not need to be proven. And, and this is acknowledging that children don't have the, the faculties to make informed consent decisions. Looking at this problem uh, in terms of its significance, you may ask, you know, what, what, what does this compare with? Um, estimates from the FBI and, and others have put the proceeds of human trafficking worldwide to be third only behind uh, illicit narcotics and illegal firearms. And the ILO has, puts the, the dollar figure on that to be $150 billion in proceeds a year. 99 million, a billion of that is from sexual exploitation, even though that percentage of the overall problem is just 19%. So that shows you how lucrative sex trafficking is, uh, rel even relative to forced labor, to labor trafficking. Um, so it's quite significant, about five times more, more, uh, more lucrative. So just to walk you through the, the, the main forms of trafficking, you've seen uh, that, that definition, those three pillars, the acts, the means, and the exploitation. Generally, we're talking about sex trafficking or labor trafficking. And, and as, as the data shows, about 5 million uh, people are victims of sex trafficking worldwide. These are mainly women and girls, almost the vast majority. 74% um, are exploited outside their country. And that's, that's significant because that's not the case with, with other categories. And uh, about a fifth of them are, are children, are girls under the age of 18. Then we have labor trafficking. And this is the much larger category, at least in terms of number of victims. Um, it's about uh, 65%. And this, is a, this has a number of subcategories. Um, and similar to the, the term human trafficking, there are a number of different terms we can use here, forced labor, or we call it labor trafficking, or trafficking for the purposes of labor exploitation, which is a very long term. But it's, uh, again, it's the largest form. And the, some of the main categories that we see under that are bonded labor, domestic servitude, forced child labor, forced begging, and forced criminality. And, uh, and I'll walk through some of these. Domestic servitude is a, a particularly um, difficult area. And this involves uh, largely women, but some men involved in domestic work. Um, often tend to be migrants in a, in a different country. Uh, the challenge here is, is, uh, is exacerbated by the fact that labor laws in many countries don't cover domestic workers. So uh, it's considered informal work. Uh, they're also working in a private home, which is not your normal workplace. And it's a place that's difficult to inspect. And also, they're, all, they're often working alone without uh, another worker. Uh, uh, investigators at DOJ and FBI call these single victim cases. Um, and they're difficult to investigate because uh, of the lack of corroborating evidence. But yet they're, they're very, um, they can be very serious. And, uh, and we see these in the United States as we see them uh, in elsewhere, elsewhere in the world. Forced, forced child labor, and I want to point out that you know child labor is a is a universal problem. Uh, the ILO estimates that there are 154 million children in labor, uh, but we don't consider all of those children to be trafficking victims. Uh, that's that's uh, thus the term forced child labor, and though that 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 splitting of the definition can at times be difficult. It basically relies on the issue of whether a child is with his or her family, is uh, outside being commercially exploited by a third party. And under that 25 million 
estimate of, of trafficking victims, about uh, 4 million of them are, are children in forced labor. The greatest concentration, similar to the overall concentration of, of human trafficking, is in Asia, broader Asia, which is you know, from South Asia to, to East and the Pacific. Forced begging and criminal and forced criminality is something that uh, we see in parts of the world where children are, are, are um, used by gangs to go out on the street and beg. Uh, and um, if, if anyone's seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire uh, about children in, in, uh, in India, that is a, a case of, of human trafficking where where the, the, the star, the boy, was, was pushed into, into begging. And, uh, and some are even intentionally maimed to, uh, to uh, increase the, uh, the apparent need for, for begging or attractiveness to beg. Also similar to that, um, some criminal gangs use children for drug trafficking, for petty crimes, um, and, uh, and keep them, uh, you know, in, in that situation under the threat of violence um, to, uh, to earn money. And finally, child soldiering. Uh, this is a unique form of, of human trafficking that's, uh, that's found in, um, in some places, often in, uh, in countries in Africa, when governments or non-governmental uh, armed groups uh, recruit children into armed service for, for fighting. Um, we've seen this with the Lord's Resistance Army, which is a, an insurgent group in the Congo. Um, we've seen it uh, in, in, uh, in Colombia by some of the narco insurgencies. And very close to this is also coercing children into extremist activities or terrorist activities. And you might have seen some of the stories um, out of Boko Haram, which currently operates in northern Nigeria and southern Niger, kidnapping children. Um, and uh, while some of them are being held uh, hostage for, for ransom, others are forced into actual combat or, or conducting activities of an extremist nature, ISIS as well in the, in the Middle East. And I say this is unique because it also requires a unique response that's different from, from other other forms of uh, trafficking. So looking at, uh, at you know, back to the, the means that I mentioned that, that, that uh, column on, what is it that traffickers use to extract this, this, uh, this unfree labor, or unfree service? Debt seems to be the largest single source. The ILO estimates that 50% of those 25 million victims were are victimized through the use of debt, at least in some form. And, and one of the most common ways we see that um, manifested is migrants, both across borders and even within countries who are, um, who are coerced into paying a recruitment fee, a migration fee to find work, to make that move to a better job um, and end up uh, assuming a large debt that is then used to keep them in that state of servitude. Um, and I'll go through some examples um, shortly. The, the key uh, uh, factor here is that this kind, this is non-physical and that makes it very difficult to detect unlike uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, which can be, you know, can be, can be inspected, can be found um, this requires much more um, investigation, it requires interviewing workers, gaining their trust to learn what were the conditions in which they entered a job or are still remaining in, in a job. So now I'd like just to go through some examples of uh, types of traffic that, uh, that we're, we're seeing uh, both in the US close to you and, and other parts of the world. So the sex trafficking of US citizens. And this is a, a story of, uh, from, a, from a real case uh, that was documented by the McCain Institute. Um, 
where, and it's, you know, even though we say that every trafficking case is unique, and, and that certainly is true, this is, uh, fits within a pattern that, that's seen where teenage girls who um, leave home, even for a short while, as in this case, uh, become vulnerable to an approach by a trafficker, a recruiter, who then lures them into an unsafe situation where they're unsure of where they are and then um, have some key liberties removed like their phone, ability to communicate and suddenly they're in a situation um, that they can't get out of. Uh, traffickers, uh, regardless of the type of exploitation that they're trying to um, achieve and their nationality have one thing in common, they're always looking for vulnerabilities. And so we talk a lot about the vulnerabilities of particular people. Are they away from home? Do they not understand their surroundings? Do they not have adequate documentation? Um, are they disabled? Uh, do, they, do they not have um, full uh, intellectual or mental development? Um, these kinds of things are what the traffickers are, are looking for. And in this case, it was the vulnerability was uh, a young girl in distress. We see forced labor of, of uh, foreign migrants in the United States. I, I picked this because I found it um, just uh, uh, representative of, of how, how diverse trafficking can, appear, can be. Uh, call this the ice cream servitude case, where some Ukrainian exchange students uh, in the United States legally um, were were uh, forced by a Russian-operated ice cream uh, company in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, to man these uh, ice cream trucks and, and work um, excessive hours with no pay or little pay and were denied an ability to call or um, seek help. And so this became a, a federal trafficking case in 2007. What we see um, quite often is, is foreign labor among migrant uh, workers. And so i just, whoops. Among migrant workers in, um, in what, what is known as destination countries or countries that are more prosperous and have industries that are labor intensive. And a, a big one is construction. And so the Gulf countries of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, um, uh, the UAE, they, they're all uh, right now experiencing um, construction booms of one sort or another. And they rely heavily on foreign workers usually from South Asia, that's Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, also some from Southeast Asia, like Cambodia and uh, Myanmar. Um, and workers from those countries, uh, low skilled, are paying large amounts of money. And I say that relative to what uh, they're earning both in their countries and what they expect to earn in those Gulf countries which is usually in the Gulf countries, a construction job will be around 200 to $250 a month. So they're paying 1,000 to $3,000 for the, for the ability, for the you know, privilege of getting those jobs and finding that once they get to those uh, countries, that first they have their documents taken away, their passport, their return, air ticket, anything else, uh, and then that the conditions of work that were sold to them, that were presented to them in their, in their home country are quite different. They actually uh, involve uh, excessive hours, um, lack of overtime pay, maybe even a completely different form of work. They signed up for a particularly skilled job and they're doing you know, manual labor. Um, and, and then, the delayed payment of wages and that debt that they have to repay as they work uh, in the country keeps them in a state of, of uh, forced labor. 
and that's that's debt bondage. Another another type of forced labor is bonded labor, and it's found most uh, most prevalently in South Asia and within that within that region, India. And these tend to be low caste people, um, the, the castes that are considered untouchables or or um, restricted castes, um, and have inherited a debt from their parents sometimes, but other times just imposed by an employer in, their, in the worker's time of need when they needed a short-term loan to meet an, a family expense, uh, a medical emergency, and then they're forced to work off that debt for that particular employer. And this is found most often in labor-intensive industries like brick kilns uh, and rice mills and uh, quarries, things like that. Um, India and Pakistan. This has existed for, for generations and the repayment of debt is, is made very difficult by employers because it's constantly growing with, uh, with every new expense that a family incurs. It's added to their bill and uh, at inflated costs and this ensures a steady workforce for the employer with, uh, with no real compensation. It's illegal in India and in Pakistan, but uh, but it's very hard to it's been very hard to to identify and punish. Uh, just another example of forced labor of of migrant workers, and this is one that uh, that Stan probably can identify with. We see it quite a bit in Southeast Asia, is exploitation in the fishing industry, uh, and this is a true story of a Cambodian man who was imprisoned on a Thai fishing boat for four years, unable to, uh, to, to, to leave. He was beaten, mistreated, poorly fed. And at one point when the boat was docked off the coast of uh, Malaysian Borneo, he, he, he and a colleague jumped and swam to shore only to be picked up by some police and then sold into a, um, another forced labor situation on a palm oil plantation. He actually became a uh, uh, a spokesperson for uh, for uh, against trafficking uh, uh. in Cambodia. Yeah. So, just uh, I, I'll I'll wrap up. Um, you'll see some additional uh, points that uh, just provide some background on the effort against trafficking. Uh, but I want to try to keep this short in, in hopes of having some good discussion. I just want to point out that the the U.S. Uh, has been a, le a leader on the global um, stage in fighting trafficking. In the year 2000, both the U.S. and the U.N. forged definitions on trafficking and, and law. The U.S. with its Trafficking Victims Protection Act, the first time that we actually uh, put all of the trafficking issues in one law criminalized them, provided protections for victims. And at the same time, the US was in the lead with uh, the UN's international law and it lacked on the global stage, there wasn't uh, uh, a law and that is called the 2000, well, the protocol to prevent suppression, punish trafficking in persons. Um, in short, the Palermo protocol named after the city where it was forged. And that uh, has over 170 countries who have ratified uh, that, which is, is pretty good for an international instrument. So the US has been in the, in the front of leading uh, this international effort. And it came up with a, a format of addressing trafficking through what's called the three Ps, prosecuting cases of human trafficking, protecting the victims of trafficking, and making efforts to prevent uh, future cases. Uh, and that's, that's a framework that's endured for the last 21 years and is used by, by most uh, practitioners uh, in the UN and throughout the world. Um, that law in the US also set up an important office in the State Department that coordinates the foreign uh, dipl diplomatic efforts on, on human trafficking and works with the over 200 embassies and consulates around the world like what um, Stan was mentioning, 
at the embassy in Jakarta to uh, identify areas where the US can provide funding to help governments and NGOs in tackling trafficking and to feed into an annual trafficking in persons report um, that uh, assesses anti-trafficking efforts uh, in every country in the world or almost every country in the world. And, and that's what I was involved in for 10 years. So I'll stop there because um, I realize I've, I've taken up a good chunk of time. You'll see some some uh, trends and challenges that we're seeing right now, but I'm happy to talk more about any of those or any other issue that uh, that you might have for, for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so anyway, we have some good questions from the audience, and so we'll get to those. We have plenty of time. Uh, but Mark, I just want to ask you one question first. I, I, I noticed that when I came back to the United States and learned more about, about the trends of trafficking here in the States and Colorado and elsewhere, that many of the same sort of local law enforcement misperceptions about trafficking victims that we tried to educate people in Southeast Asia existed here. For example, uh, you know, regarding underage girls who are in prostitution as prostitutes, um, regarding undocumented laborers who were, who were being trafficked as simply undocumented laborers. Um, could you comment wh whether, whether the local uh, law enforcement in the United States, uh, whether it, it, it is addressing the, the trafficking issues the way that we, that, that we wanted the countries in Southeast Asia to do so? Sure, yeah, and that's a, that's a very good point. So one of the, the key principles on victim protection that's found uh, in the TVPA, that's the US law and the international law, is not, not punishing victims for any crimes that they've committed as part of being trafficked. And it's, it's super important, and, but very hard to, to implement. And so Stan just mentioned one way, um, or at least alluded to it, uh, in which that appears, and that is girls who have been forced into prostitution uh, in any country, but we see it in the United States. Um, obviously prostitution is a crime. And in the past we've seen local law enforcement um, punish uh, those, those victims of trafficking for prostitution violations. And, and we've seen this in other countries as well, just as we advocate for that, for that reform uh, internationally, we need to have that at the local level. Uh, and so states have, there's been a, a campaign that's still underway to have states pass what's called safe harbor laws uh, for that particular purpose so that uh, children who are found in criminal activity, but only because of being trafficked, that's they're being coerced into doing uh, criminal activity, will not be punished, will not have those uh, crimes put on their record. Um, before this call, I checked, and as far as I can tell, Colorado still doesn't have a safe harbor law. It's one of the 16 states that lacks it. So that's, that's still on a to-do list. Um, so that, that would, you know, and as these uh, states pass those kind of reforms, it also um, serves to vacate, uh, I think is the legal term, crimes that are on the records of, of former trafficking victims which is super important. If you're a trafficking victim who's gone through that kind of trauma and exploitation, yet you have a, a crime on your record that shouldn't be there, it hurts in getting a job and getting assistance from some sources. So having those officially removed or vacated uh, really helps with reintegration. Okay, Mark, we have a couple of good questions about law enforcement uh, against traffickers. Andy McKean asks, what is a typical penalty for traffickers that are caught and tried and convicted? And then related to that from Haley Hamilton, he asked just more about statistics on conviction of trafficking. For example, what percentage of cases are investigated and convicted? And are there any confounding charges like drugs or money laundering that lead to investigation of conviction? The sort of things that used to drive me crazy when you asked for those statistics. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so, it, uh, 
first I'll start off with the standard. Um, the international standard that, that uh, Palermo Protocol, the protocol is part of a larger convention against organized crime. Um, that's how the international community, the UN decided to deal with trafficking when it wanted to create this law is to, to make it part of a, uh, to see it as organized crime. And there, there are pros and cons to that. Um, but in that convention, it said that any, any crime that's covered by this convention or its protocols like the trafficking needs to be punished by a minimum maximum of four years imprisonment. So that means a, a punishment that prescribes at least four years. Um, that's, that's, that's quite, you know, that's low by some standards, but at least it sets out something and, and, um, and delineates that this is a, a crime that requires that kind of punishment. What we see around the world on average is 10 to 20 years. The U.S. is a maximum 20 years unaggravated, that means without additional uh, counts. Um, some countries have the death penalty. And we don't uh, encourage that. Um, Bangladesh has it. Uh, I'm working on that country right now, so I, it's very fresh in my memory. Uh, but usually it's, it's a 10 to 20 year um, prescribed uh, punishment. Now, in terms of what we're actually seeing in terms of investigations and prosecutions, um, we're seeing far more cases identified, investigated, and prosecuted on sex trafficking. Um, and that's true almost everywhere in the world. Um, in, in the US, it's certainly the case. I think last year, fiscal 2000, and or the last year for which we have data to 2019, it was about um, close to 300 federal convictions on sex trafficking and only 14 on labor. Uh, federally, federal prosecutions are easier to track, state level prosecutions, um, far less so because it requires uh, you know, adequate reporting into, a, into, the, into the centralized database. And that's a problem we face in other countries. And Indonesia was a, class, was, you know, a, a good example where a, a decentralized system made it very difficult to get uh, aggregate numbers on prosecutions and convictions. But what we're seeing if, in terms of the magnitude that 25 million victims is just a tiny fraction of the problem being prosecuted. Uh, right now, uh, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but the uh, labor prosecutions are, are, are less than 1,000 in the world, where sex trafficking is more like 10,000 10, convictions. So um, I can go into why I think there is that disparity, which is, is a lopsided, you know, it's a, it's, it's reversely proportional, sex trafficking being only 20% of the problem, but accounting for something like 80% of prosecutions. Um, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's another that's a additional discussion. So I'll stop there. Okay, well, we can get back to that later, later perhaps. But um, uh, I have a question from Hugh Dickey. Is there a rating system of how much trafficking goes on by country and which countries do the best and which are the worst? Yeah. <laughs> yes, so the, the, the tip report that I mentioned and, and which I um, was so involved in for a number of years at the State Department, that, that's its main function, is to assess the trafficking problems around the world and the quality of the response um, and assign a number. Uh, and there are four different numbers. These are set out by the law that Congress gave us, gave, well, gave the State Department. Um, the highest being one and the lowest being three. And in the middle, there's two and there's a 2.5 or two watch list. Um, so what's, what's, uh, what's used in making those evaluations to, to, is, a, uh, is a number of criteria. Uh, I think it's about 15 in total now called the minimum standards. And those cover those three Ps that I mentioned, prosecution, efforts to protect victims and efforts to prevent. But it is very heavy <clears throat> on the prosecution side. In fact, about 75% of the, the, the standards are focused exclusively on <clears throat> the quality of, of those law enforcement or criminal justice efforts. So um, you, we find that um, it's easier for developed countries 
that have resources, that have robust and, um, and trustworthy justice systems um, to respond better. Uh, you see most of Western Europe in tier one, uh, North America in tier one, but uh, countries that don't have that capacity um, or have challenges in terms of integrity in, in law enforcement and justice um, struggling and, and on the lower, lower end. There is an attempt to, to, um, uh, to weigh that, those assessments based on resources and capacity, but still that's, that's generally what happens. Also, countries where exploitation is happening, whether that's uh, from foreign migrants who are being trafficked into them, into their countries, um, are gonna, are gonna usually face more scrutiny because that's where you know, the, the exploitation is most visible. Uh, source countries, less so. But these are just the general um, impressions, the general trends. Okay, um, Robert Mueller asks, uh, do you have insights into the Wag into the Wager forced labor uh, genocide uh, conditions in Xinjiang? Not a, a, a lot, not personally, I haven't done personal work on that, but um, I do know that, uh, that cotton and some other agricultural commodities in the, in the Uyghur areas of China um, have been the subject of uh, forced labor allegations for some time, similar to some of the Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan. Um, and one, one tool, I, I noted a, this on the last slide and the last point, a, a tool that's existed for some time in uh, the US but wasn't really used is, is suddenly being used more often. It started last year. And this is uh, the 1930 Trade Act, the Smoot-Hawley Act. Um, Section 307 actually prohibits the importation of products made with forced labor, including child labor or forced child labor. It wasn't used for some technical reasons. There were some clauses in there that made it very difficult to implement and those were fixed. Uh, a couple of years ago through an executive order. And now um, Customs and Border Protection, CPB, is issuing almost on a weekly basis what they call withholding release orders on particular shipments of products uh, from overseas and cotton products, cotton coming out of um, the Uyghur uh, areas of China or, sub, or one such withholding uh, release order. Uh, Uzbekistan has already been um, targeted as well. Usually these were withholding release orders focus very specifically on a particular company. And, and that was the case, I think it was uh, in December on a, a Malaysian palm oil company, Sim Darby, a huge, huge uh, producer of palm oil. Um, but in the case of the, of the Uyghur cotton and Uzbekistan cotton, I think it's, it's the entire sector. Um, so so that's, uh, that's interesting. On, on genocide allegations, I, I, I don't have uh, uh, enough to, to, to make any kind of intelligent comment. Um, so um, Bruce McDonald is asking um, if sharecropping is subject to regulation under trafficking and labor laws. Uh, I, not by, not per se. I mean, this uh, often, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have that kind of a, of a, of a question um, and even ask it ourselves. We'll see something and say, is this trafficking? And we really just have to apply that, uh, those three elements and say, okay, is the sharecropping, you know, is it, is it exploitative? And is that exploitative to the point that someone can't leave without serious harm? That's really the, the, the test. Um, and that serious harm can be financial debt or it can be threats or of, of, of other kinds of harm. Um, so that, that's the key thing. Um, so, you know, in itself, no, it would, it would have to, you know, require further investigation. And, I, and just, just a, a point in that this is what makes the, this problem so uh, difficult is that 
it's hidden. Um, it can be in many, uh, you know, existing in many legitimate um, or, or sectors that aren't considered trafficking. And the only way to really uh, identify it is, is to take the time and, and do some investigation. Um, and I think, you know, back to the first question, this is where law enforcement often with a lot of uh, competing priorities uh, and press for time doesn't take the time to investigate. They see one indication and it's a, it's a false indication. They think it's, okay, this is not trafficking. This is something else. It's people smuggling. It's, it's a uh, lack of documentation. Um, it's, it's prostitution and not taking the time to explore further. Um, so that's, uh, that's why we, we in, in trainings, investigators uh, really have impressed on them the issue that you, once you see one of these identified indicators, and the ILO has come up with a very good list of 11, you really need to then presume it's trafficking until you can prove it's not. It's the only way of really, um, you know, hoping to, to identify this hidden population. Otherwise, they'll go unidentified. Okay, so Andy McKean is asking a question about the student movement, My Freedom Day. And he's asking, what is the goal of that? And, and maybe I'll expand on that question a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, what, what, uh, uh, is there su su sufficient public awareness that, that, this, that in order that civil society is playing a role in preventing trafficking? Sure. So um, actually, I, I'm not entirely sure what, um, what my Freedom Day, uh, what the objectives are. I know obviously it's, it's general public awareness. Um, uh, I would hope that CNN has some specific uh, you know, advice if people go to, um, to CNN's Freedom uh, website, that they'll get some advice on how they can contribute productively in, in advancing things like, you know, if there's a particular uh, reform at the state level, legislation at the national level, um, or organizations that you can support financially or through volunteer work. Um, and, on, and I know CNN has been running uh, this freedom uh, program for, for years now. And it's interesting because it started almost 15 years ago and it was only supposed to last one year, but because of the great response that CNN's had, they've kept it, kept it going ever since. Um, on, on civil society, I think what's really most encouraging for me, um, and I think I would hope for others in the, you know, working in this space is that we've seen so many good organizations um, stand up uh, in communities and, and take off and just, we, we laugh and say that 20 years ago, we could fit all of us into you know, a Volkswagen bus um, working on this issue, but you look around now and it's just, the, the space is, is, uh, is quite robust and that's great. The more the, more the better. Um, there, there are NGOs at the local level, there are national uh, NGOs in the US like Polaris Project, which runs the, the US um, hotline for trafficking, uh, IJM, the International Justice Mission, which um, has really focused on uh, campus activism in colleges and universities and has uh, international operations in I believe over 25 countries. So they're all different levels of, of uh, this kind of CSO response and it's great to see. Yeah, I just wanna add that I, the, that I really admired Nicholas Kristoff taking up the case of trafficking and that Cambodian girl. Right, yeah. and, and he continues to write on trafficking quite often. Yeah. yeah, he does. It seems to be one of the issues he cares most about. Um, Haley Hamilton asked a question about why do females make up the vast majority of victims? Are females simply easier to physically restrain or does it have to do with the labor market or some other factor? Well, yeah, I think some of that, um, the answer is, is in some of that question. Um, Yes, traffickers do, when I, I mentioned earlier that traffickers are looking for vulnerabilities and uh, 
on the labor side, we know that um, exploitative employers see female workers as, as, more, um, as easier to manipulate, easier to control. Uh, I remember going into some um, apparel factories in a country um, years ago and was surprised that all the, all the workers were female. And uh, the supervisor said quite candidly, he said, we tried some men, but they just, they would complain and get unruly if we were pushing them too hard. So we got rid of them. Um, on the sex trafficking side, well, sex trafficking really, uh, with, with only a few exceptions, relies on prostitution. Um, so within that broader realm of prostitution, which can be legal in some countries, usually is not, it, not legal, but it, but it can be voluntary. That's where you find sex trafficking. And, and that's almost exclusively female. And so that's why you have the, I mean, that's a, that's a demand issue. Um, and, and, and that's a, it's a whole, another area of focus is reducing demand for modern day slavery. Um, but, uh, but on labor, yes, it's, it's, it's that perception that women are, are more vulnerable, are more um, easier to control. Um, so Mark, I was wondering, uh, do you have do you have any advice for maybe maybe some of the members here want want to become involved in uh, preventing trafficking or raising awareness of it? Is do you have any advice for for members of the public like like our members here? Sure. Um, each each uh, state and some cities have uh, have uh, anti trafficking uh, task force. Um, now those are those generally tend to be you know, the operational made up of NGOs and government officials, but they often have a, a public outreach uh, component um, and and have public events that uh, people can get involved in. Um, I would imagine that, that there's something like that in uh, in Colorado, um, but I can also send some some links of NGOs that uh, are operating nationally um, that have. Uh, public events that you can either um, volunteer time for or, or, or commit um, financial contributions to help them with their work. They're usually also action items, uh, like I mentioned, the, the safe harboring um, you know, reform that's needed in a, in a few remaining states. And uh, forgive me if, I'm, if, if, I, if it's already been done in Colorado, but those kinds of things Need need public support to, to push through, and it, it makes a big difference um, in the effort. Yeah, I mean they do have this task force here, and an FBI agent who's dedicated to, to that here, and other organizations. But I'm not sure about safe harboring. That that's a really good question that we that we can look into. Um, what just just one last question. Um, so a lot of a lot of victims of trafficking. Um, go overseas, they, they pursue jobs in places where they're vulnerable uh, and, and they do that knowing that they, that they could be trafficked or maybe they've been, been trafficked in the past. Can you address the issue of, of, of how difficult it is, a, a decision it is for someone who needs work and needs income, but still, still has to face the issue of trafficking? Sure, sure. Right now I'm, um, I'm doing some, uh, some work on Bangladesh, having to do it remotely. Um, but one of the thing that's, things that strikes me and it's so distressing is that uh, migrants who are feeling the, the, the great stress of, of the lack of economic opportunities at home, family pressures, know that uh, they face real dangers in going abroad and maybe have already faced it, have already gone through a very traumatic experience, are still taking that step out the door um, because they feel they have no other options. Um, and uh, the, it's distressing because efforts that the international community, NGOs make on trying to uh, raise awareness, you know, those don't really work in, the, in that case because uh, they're, already, they're already aware that they, they understand, um, and unfortunately, during COVID, even though we're seeing a temporary uh, uh, diminishment in, in trafficking just by virtue of, of businesses closing down, of 
of uh, sex uh, prostitution just not being available, uh, I think we're gonna see an explosion when um, the restrictions are lifted because people have uh, gone so long without wages, um, are, are feeling just so much more vulnerable. Uh, and that's, that's where, that's the big challenge for everyone working on trafficking is to address that, um, that it's, uh, it's much more than an awareness. Uh, it's, it's providing meaningful um, and sustainable employment opportunities that aren't, they, they can still be abroad. It's one thing that, you know, sometimes it's the message can be misinterpreted. We don't wanna tell people not to migrate but we want to find migration opportunities that are safe. And we want to make sure that the employers in those migrant destinations aren't exploiting people. So, so yeah. Ann Moore has an interesting question related to that. Um, she asks, are migrant workers closely monitored so as not to be taken advantage of? Not, um, not, not anywhere near enough. Um, when you look at some of the big migration destinations, like say, say Singapore um, or the UAE, migrant workers tend to be put in dormitories. And some of these are huge. And Singapore opened one uh, that is 30,000, um, one, one single compound that held 30,000 workers. And these tend to have their own security systems, often either directly provided by the employer or through a consortia of employers. And it's, it's very difficult for outsiders who have the migrant workers' welfare, um, you know, um, in mind uh, to to get access and understand what's going on, what are the conditions. So that's a that's a running battle of trying to get employers to let outside um, parties talk to the migrants, and you know, it's presented as, look, this is in your interest. You want a happy worker. You want a worker who's not exploited. So and and. And they're not going to often share that with an employer because of, of the power dynamics. They're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of repercussions. So there's a big move to, to create that, that third party um, pillar, if you will. Worker voice is one term being used. But it's, and trying to get employers to pay for it because it's obviously not cheap to, to do that. Okay, well, Mark, I think it's, we're at the end of the hour right now. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, for the excellent questions and for your interest and concern for, for this issue, uh, which the more you learn about it, the really the more compelled I think everybody will be to do something to stop it. I uh, would like to put a plug in for the U.S. Department of State's annual trafficking in persons report. Um, there, I think you can really read about what's going on in general trends worldwide and in each country. And also, they always have stories about uh, victims who, who are trafficking heroes, uh, persons who were victims of it and overcame that, and then played a role um, in, fighting, in fighting trafficking. Um, Mark, did you, did you want to make any fi final remarks before we sign off tonight? Uh I think I've covered a lot. Just to, if you have any additional questions or uh, if there's anything I can, can help you with references uh, to, to NGOs, um, home and abroad, please, uh, um, please ask uh, Joe or, or Stan. Uh, they have my email address. I'd be happy to, 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 to provide the information. But I'm just thankful for your time. Um, even though over the last 20 years, awareness has grown considerably it's still not a problem. It's still a problem that's not well understood. And as we started in the very beginning of this, this hour, uh, it, it is often conflated or misunderstood with other things. And that's the point I'd just like to leave with is that trafficking, it's, it's always in existing with, with uh, other issues. It's never found just alone. It's always part of prostitution or migration or labor issues or human rights issues but yet it deserves its own response because the trauma of victims is unique. It is slave-like. And, and that's really what uh, we're striving for is that kind of dedicated response that says, you know, no, you're not, a, uh, you're not an illegal migrant. You're not uh, uh, someone who violated prostitution law. 
you are a trafficking victim, and, and this is how we're going to ensure that this doesn't happen again, and we're going to restore your life. Okay, well, that's great. So the, the last question is a comment, and it's thank you for your presentation. It was excellent <laughs> and uh, really compelling. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, we, we hope to invite you back to Colorado for a, another virtual presentation at some point. I'd love to go to Colorado. Yeah, I've, I haven't been there in a long time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very. Thank you very much. And good night, everybody. Good night. Good morning, Mark. <laughs> Have a good night. And good night to everybody else. Thank you.